next guest. He's an award-winning historian, a Bancroft, and Pulitzer Prize-winning author. Gordon Wood joins us today. Gordon, how are you doing? Fine, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. So my, my I'm going to I'm going to give you a few more credits here, but if I did read your whole profile, I think that would take up all the time in our interview. <laughs> So Gordon is an Alva O. Way University Pre Professor Emeritus at Brown University, and among his many contributions and achievements to history, he was awarded the National Humanities Medal by President Barack Obama. So today we could be talking about many things, but we're going to talk about your latest book, uh, Friends Divided, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. So you have a salon series coming up at the Providence Athenaeum Friday, March 16th, starting at 5 o'clock. So if you don't get your fill on the book today, you can always go and hear more from the professor. So once again, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. All right, so let's talk about these two very important figures in our American history. Um, many people probably know a lot more about one than the other, and you decided to take a deep dive into the two and their relationship. Why did you decide to write the book? Well, I was going to write on Adams uh, because I had just finished three volumes editing uh, three volumes of Adams' writings for the Library of America. But my editor um, at Penguin, uh, Scott Moyers, said, why don't you compare him to Jefferson? And suddenly the idea intrigued me, and uh, I'm glad I did because I learned more about each of these men by pitting one against the other. Uh, so it, I think I... I, I made the right decision based on his suggestion. Did you have fun looking at the relationship between the two and kind of comparing and contrasting? Definitely. Uh, they, they, so, they differ so much, it's almost incredible that they became friends. They differed on every conceivable issue you could think of. The only thing they had in common was the support for the revolution. Of course, both were radicals. And they had a common enemy in Alexander Hamilton. Uh, so that, that, bond, that helped to bond them. But otherwise, they differed in their attitudes towards government, towards religion, towards uh, human nature, uh, towards everything you could think of, uh, everything that matters. So they, they were different. How do you think we can look at their relationship today and kind of learn from that? Because you said they really just, they were totally two different people and their ideolog ideology totally differed but they still managed to be friends in the end. <laughs> well, they, they broke in the 1790s when parties emerged. Uh, Adams was a Federalist, that is, he supported the, the administration, George Washington. He was vice president with Washington, and he succeeded to the presidency in 1796, but Jefferson was his leading opponent. The Jeffersonian Republicans had emerged in opposition to Washington and Hamilton. And so they were on opposite ends of the uh, political spectrum, but they also differed over the French Revolution and the role that America should play in the world. Uh, so they, and it was a bitter uh, confrontation that came to a climax in the election of 1800 when they really were uh, uh, opponents. He, he, Adams assumed that he would be reelected to the presidency just as Washington had. And when Jefferson beat him, um, that was a humiliation, and he was so bitter uh, that he refused to attend, Ad, uh, Adams refused to attend Jefferson's inauguration, and they never spoke for 12 years until they were brought together back and reconciled by the work of Dr. Benjamin Rush, who was their mutual friend and one of these two men, one the, the prime northerner, and, that, and at that point Jefferson was the southerner, uh, and they wanted, he thought that they represented the two, uh, he thought that both of them represented the two poles of the revolution. They need to, needed to be brought together and exchange ideas before they, before they died. And of course, the, what's most extraordinary is linked them ever since. They died in uh, 1826 on July 4th, the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, such a coincidence that uh, most people in the country thought it was providential that God had somehow dictated this uh, this marvelous coincidence. I it, it really is unbelievable. Right. It, it, it's so unbelievable that it's it's almost you can't believe. That of course, it, really it was happened. a little managed <laughs> in the sense that uh, they knew the fourth was coming. Uh, they didn't know each of them was going to die at that same time. They were 500 miles apart, and they never saw each other uh, from 1800 on. Uh, and they went to, they died in 1826, they, they never met, personally met. 
But uh, they, uh, on the third, for example, Jefferson knows he's dying and he says to his doctor, is it the fourth yet? And he said, no, no, sir, it's, it's only the third. And Jefferson hung on for a few more hours and wow. then let himself go. And, and I think to some extent, Adams uh, did the same thing, although not realizing that Jefferson had died, he said, at the last words he's supposed to have said, Jefferson still survives. Actually, Jefferson had died five hours earlier. Talk to us a little bit about these two men and their, and their very different upbringing and their very different background. And, and talk to us about how um, their background and their upbringing really provided different contextual views on how they, they believed in dem democracy and governing. Right. Well, Jefferson was a uh, patriarch, uh, you know, a planter, slaveholder and a wealthy man, very wealthy, one of the wealthiest men. He inherited slaves from his father, land and slaves from his father, and also many more land, much more land, and many more slaves from his father-in-law. Mm -hmm. So that by 1770, he was one of the wealthiest planters in all of Virginia. Uh, and, and, but he was a radical in, in, in his support for the revolution, and he wrote a pamphlet in 1774 that was by far the most radical pamphlet uh, that appeared in that whole debate with the empire, the imperial debate, until Thomas Paine's Common Sense. Now, Adams was very different. He came from a middling background, uh, from Quincy. He had very few connections. He didn't uh, dominate Massachusetts at all until he became, through sheer um, hard work and sheer ability, one of the top, well, the top lawyer. By 1770, he was by far the busiest and um, the best lawyer, in, uh, best attorney in, in the whole colony of Massachusetts. And most of his wealth, in fact almost all of it, came from his law practice. But he never became one of the wealthiest mem members of the Massachusetts society, something that always uh, rankled him. So they came from very different backgrounds. But the irony is that, of, of course, uh, Jefferson was a radical and so were the, the, his fellow planters. They're, they're very, uh, they come from a hierarchical, patriarchal society uh, and very unequal with 40% of the population enslaved and yet they are the liberals. They are the popular uh, party of the 1790s. Uh, if you talk about limousine liberals, well, the Jeffersonian Republicans and their leadership were limousine liberals. Uh, on, by contrast, Madison, uh, 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 Adams comes from a uh, a colony which is very egalitarian compared to the South, uh, much more democratic, uh, more people could, could vote. There are very little, very few slaves left in Massachusetts and they were all, slavery was abolished uh, legally by 1780s. So, uh, but Adams is a Federalist. He's uh, kind of concerned with hierarchy and disorder. He's uh, frightened of the people. But naturally, he's frightened of the people because the people were much more unruly, much more powerful, much more volatile in Massachusetts. So you have that paradox where the, leading of, the leaders of the popular party, the Republican, Jeffersonian Republicans, are, are slaveholders uh, who don't have to worry about elections, uh, whereas the Federalists are constantly worried about elections and have very, very uh, have great doubts about democracy. And, and you wrote that Adams thought sooner or later Americans' elections would become so partisan and, and so corrupt. <clears throat> That's which, right. <laughs> which, I mean, was he premonitant or? Well, <laughs> yeah. he, I mean, he, uh. <laughs> he uh, well, he saw it already happening, and but his solution, uh, he said, well, sooner or later we're going to have to uh, go to, first we'll have uh, offices serving for life in the Senate and the President and governors serving for life, but then eventually they'll have to become hereditary so that you could avoid elections. Wow. He felt that elections, that, uh, that's, that we wrote in a, an essay that came out in 1791. Uh, Jefferson was appalled by it, horrified by it, uh, and Adams pulled back and, and when he published his essays uh, in a book in 1805, uh, a decade and a half later, he, he left that essay out because it had become too embarrassing for him suggesting that we would have to be have hereditary offices, the exact opposite of republicanism. But Adams was enamored of the uh, English Constitution and wanted uh, protections uh, for, from, from all parts of the government. He, he, he's probably responsible 
for our um, checks and balances in our constitutions. He was very influential on the state constitution making in 1776. He wrote a pamphlet that was picked up by uh, many, many of the constitution makers at the state level. And then, of course, he, he drafted the Massachusetts state constitution of 1780. And what he contributed more than any, anything else is that the, the veto power given to the executive. He wanted an absolute veto, but of course, that was too much for most of his colleagues, and so they had a qualified veto that is could be overridden by two thirds of the legislature. Well, that gets written into the Massachusetts Constitution, which was the first constitution to have that particular veto power, and that, that that's picked up by the uh, federal um, in the federal constitution by the convention in 1787. Even though Adams and Jefferson, neither of them was present in Philadelphia when the federal constitution was drawn. But he had, an he had an influence on constitution making and, and limiting uh, uh, democracy and limiting the, uh, the few as well. He, he was much more frightened of the, arist the aristocrats uh, than he was of the, uh, of the people. Um, but he's frightened of all power. And uh, in so far as we, are, uh, we have checks and balances, Adams deserves a lot of credit for, uh, for checking power. And because he had, Adams had all of these, really was one of the founding fathers, why is it that so many of us know Thomas Jefferson so much more? How come, how is it that he is so much more remembered? You wrote in one of your book talks that it's easier, there, there's all these memorials for Thomas Jefferson, it's easier to get to his house. Right, right. We can go find him. He's, he's honored in so many more ways, whereas contributions could you know, be right. looked at similarly. There's just a difference. Uh, there was a difference then, too. The crucial thing was that Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, uh, and that became the source of his fame. Little did he know he would be famous because of that. Neither of them thought that the de writing the Declaration, making a draft. Adams was, uh, was so busy, and the com there, was a com there was a committee of five, and Adams and Jefferson were both on that committee, but Adams, at the point in 1776, in the spring of 1776, he's serving on two dozen committees, chairing many of them, including the Board of War. That is, essentially, he's fighting the war at this point. Uh, he, he, Jefferson arrives late uh, to the Second Continental Congress, and he's the young squirt. He's eight years younger than Adams. And so they think, and he had written this pamphlet, and he's obviously a graceful writer. So they assign him the task of drafting the Declaration. <laughs> and only later, in the 1790s, his supporters, uh, Republican Party supporters, began claiming Thomas Jefferson is the author of the Declaration of Independence. And Adams is appalled. The author? The author? He says he's a draftsman. And, and suddenly, uh, the Declaration, especially the part that we now celebrate, all men are created equal became uh, the rallying call, call uh, cry of his Republican Party, and it elevated him into uh, into fame. And and uh, th there was just no way Adams could compete with that. And he just was so upset by that, so jealous, so envious of that fame that Jefferson was getting. And Jefferson came to realize that he, he was going to be remembered for that. And so he actually gave, uh, he writes his son-in-law and says, I'm going to give you the desk on, on which I wrote the declaration. It's going to be a relic, he said. He, he realized it had taken on religious significance, uh, spiritual significance. And it was just something that, that Adams just could never get over, the fact that he had missed this moment in history. Uh, when they got reconciled, uh, Adams soon came to, they, they, get, they got reconciled in 1812, after these 12 years of silence between them. And, and uh, Benjamin Rush, who was a mutual friend, closer to Adams than Jefferson, worked at it for two years to bring them together. It was, they were reluctant because they had been such bitter enemies. And the election of 1800 was the most scurrilous in our history. We think our press is, uh, <laughs> is bad today. It's nothing compared to the 1790s, although ne neither of these two men actually campaigned. They stayed, one in Monticello and the other in Quincy, but their followers said things about the, uh, their opponents that we would find um, 
te terrible today. Well, wasn't it a lot of it just totally untrue as well? Oh, they just it made just, up things. It was just right. totally it was, false. Well, you, right? you talk about fascinating. Fake, new, fake news. Yeah, it was so 1790s fake news. But they, but they came back together and they and they began exchanging letters from 1812 to 18 their death in 1826. About 158 letters with Adams writing three to every one of Jefferson's. He wow. became embarrassed by that because he was writing so much, and Jefferson said, don't mind, I, I, I must love re reading your letters. And, and then Adams realized that, well, maybe he's got more, more letters to write than I have. So he asked him, he says, how many letters did you, how many correspondence, how many letters did you receive last year? 1820 uh, was the year he asked him about. And Jefferson says, well, I received 1,200 and something. And Adams was appalled. He said, oh, I received only 123 letters. Oh. So he was receiving 10 times uh, less, fewer letters, 10 times fewer letters. Uh, and see, Jefferson, by this point, was a superstar. He was corresponding with the Tsar of Russia, with Alexander Humboldt, the great German naturalist. He was corresponding with people all over the world. Adams had none of that. So Adams immediately realized that he was not in the same celebrity league as Jefferson. And Jefferson has remained uh, way ahead of him. I mean, uh, as you said, uh, Monticello gets uh, 500,000 visitors a year. Uh, it's a World Heritage Site. That's not true of uh, Adams' very modest home up in Quincy, which is closed during the off-season. I mean, uh, and, and of course, Jefferson has a great memorial on a tidal basin right off the mall in Washington. Adams has no memorial. In Washington, um, it's they're just in different different celebrity leagues. Adams knew that right from the start, and uh, it rankled him, but he uh, he accepted it um, reluctantly. He knew that he would be always behind Washington and and Jefferson in in fame. Do do you see? Duels, feuds, rivalries, friendships like this. Do you think? It was there in the founding of our nation. It seems to still be here 200 plus years later. Do you see these kind of things just playing out over the course of history? Well, we don't have duels now. <laughs> well, uh, uh, we know but, about. <laughs> I mean, they lived in a, a very somewhat different world. It was an aristocratic world in a way that uh, all of them were, all who lived into the 19th century, and that includes Jefferson and Adams, were appalled by the society they had created. I mean, they really were upset by the, the, the results of the revolution. It, the country was much too democratic for them. Uh, it was much too money uh, obsessed. Uh, banking uh, was going crazy. Banks were being created left and right. And paper money was being issued. Now that paper money fed the economic powerhouse that turned the United States into an economic powerhouse. I mean, it made the United States be a great economic, uh, but they couldn't understand that. They had no understanding of a bank. Uh, very few people did. Hamilton was the one, one of the few people who understood how a bank worked. So they were not happy with what they had uh, created. And so they, in that sense, uh, both of them died somewhat disillusioned with what they had wrought. Uh, actually, Jefferson had become much more frightened at the end than, than Adams because of, of slavery. And the, sec and the impending sectional conflict. They were aware of that. They knew that if the Union broke apart, it would be over that issue of slavery. Uh, Adams and Jefferson, Adams was, was always digging Jefferson in the correspondence, provoking him and teasing him. Uh, for example, in 1815, uh, Jefferson was an advocate for the French Revolution, complete Francophile, and loved the French Revolution. And Adams was deeply opposed to it. So in eight, by 1815, Napoleon had been defeated, and the Bourbons were back on the throne of France. And so what does Adams do? He writes to Jefferson, so Mr. Jefferson, what do you think of the French Revolution now? And Jefferson takes all of that with good humor. He doesn't respond. He could have easily responded to these kinds of provocations that Adams uh, was making. Uh, they, uh, it's amazing. Jefferson was very polite and, and valued the relationship so much that he did not want to respond. But the one thing Adams doesn't tease him about is slavery. He knows that's just, just too sensitive an issue. It is brought up in 1819-20, 1819-1820 during the Missouri crisis. Uh, 
uh, which led to the Missouri Compromise. But that was the first premonition of most people, for most people that the North and South might break apart over mm. slavery. And, and Adams um, talks about it a little bit, but doesn't really push Jefferson on it. And Jefferson expresses uh, real fears of what's going to happen uh, to the country. So there's a, the, Adams' view was, look, I, this is a problem, it's a national problem, but I'm not going to preach to you Southern planters. It's your problem, and I'm going to let you try to solve it. But of course, they couldn't solve it, and neither did and Jefferson had no solution. By 1820, he's become a fire-eating Southerner, very defensive about his section of the country. Wow, that is fascinating. It's so interesting. If you're curious about more, of course, you can pick up the book, Friends Divided, and uh, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Before we let you go, Professor Wood, um, I do have a, a couple fun, just simple questions for you because you are such a notable historian. You've won several awards. Um, so just a couple curiosity questions. Um, I'm curious, your favorite subject or era to read about? Well, <laughs> the American Revolution. Uh, <laughs> but I also read uh, a lot of stuff on World War II, which I lived through, so uh, it's... Uh, but I, I think I do that for relaxation. But I, my professional interest, of course, is the early American period and particularly the Revolution. It, yeah, sometimes it's nice just to read for fun. Right. Um, you've written on several presidents. You've written on t the birth of this nation. Uh, favorite person in history to study? Well, I think Washington is a fascinating person. And, without doubt was respected by all of these men. He stood head and shoulders above them, both literally, I mean, both uh, in fact and, and, and figuratively as well. They respected him, uh, and I think without him, uh, the country might have fallen apart in the 1790s. So, and yet he's not, um, he's not a college graduate. He's, but he's not uh, unintelligent, and he read widely. He's an autodidact. He's much more intellectual, I think, than we've realized in the past. Uh, he had uh, the gift of silence, as Adam said, and he was a natural leader. He knew, and so we were very fortunate in producing that kind of leader. Uh, there's just no doubt that he got us through the revolution and then became the first president and, and really, that was more crucial, I think, in holding the country together, his presidency, than, than his generalship. And you have become a major part of history yourself by being such a noteworthy historian, receiving the National Humanities Medal um, by President Barack Obama. What was that honor like for you? Oh, that was wonderful. Uh, we, uh, there were lots of us, of course, about almost 20 people, I think. We had to wait for the president to be free, and so we were lined up alphabetically. Uh, that's the way we, 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 we You're we, down near the end. And I was, <laughs> next, I was next, to, next to Philip Roth, and so I got to talk to Philip Roth for almost an hour. Oh. Uh, fascinating uh, to, to talk with him about, because uh, I had read his books through the years, uh, going back to Goodbye Columbus, and so that was, that was what made that the whole experience uh, uh, fascinating. I asked him if he would go and write a short story about this event, and he says, no, he would never do that, but that's what John Updike would do, he said. <laughs> um, so it, it, was, uh, it was a great experience, and, and the president, of course, was very gracious and uh, had something to say to each of us as he presented the award, because he had, he personally made these, uh, from nominations that came to him, he made his, his uh, he, he made the decision. Wow, that says a lot go from studying presidents and, and writing about presidents to being selected by a president yourself. That's pretty remarkable. Uh, Professor Gordon Wood, thank you so much for joining us well, today. thank you for having me. He will be at the Providence Athenaeum giving a talk on his latest book, Friends Divided. You can see him March 15th if you're curious for more. I hope you'll come back and talk to us again. Great, thank you very Sometime much. Sometime soon. Me. All Great. right, we're gonna get set up for our next guest here on Go Local Live in the Navigant Credit Union Broadcast Center. Please hang tight as we do that.